Hello, and welcome to the annual Write Hive Conference. This year is jam-packed with a ton of great sessions for writers, writing professionals, and the publishing industry. Write Hive is a nonprofit serving the writing community with resources, events, programming, connections, and more. The 2023 conference brings you this session, How to Subvert Tropes. If these things interest you and you'd like to learn more, you can find us at writehive.org. I am your moderator for this panel, Rachel Shadle, and my pronouns are she, they. And right now, I'd like to turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves. I'll go ahead and start with you, Tatiana. Hello, my name is Tatiana. Um, I debuted last year, 2022, with my debut series, and this is my book over here, Bones to the Wind, <laughs> and it's and it's completed duology. Um, I write about diverse characters slaying dragons and lots of action and lots of character development and subverting tropes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we'll go with you next, Allegra. Hi, I'm Allegra Piscatore. I write fantasy and science fiction, um, primarily featuring disabled characters. And uh, subverting tropes is very near and dear to my heart since it kind of launched my entire series. So I'm very excited to be here. Awesome. Welcome, Allegra and Tatiana. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Lindsay Miller. I am an author of queer young adult series such as Mask of Shadows and What We Devour, and most recently the Prince's Young Adult series about the original Disney movies from the Prince's point of view, and Sleeping Beauty is up next. Wonderful. Uh, we'll go ahead and go with you, uh, CH. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is CH. Um, but I go by Cindy, so anybody's welcome to refer to me as Cindy. I use the pronouns she and her. And I'm probably going to be a little different here because I write mostly short fiction. And I don't stick to one genre. So I've written uh, and published fiction in science fiction, fantasy, crime. Um, the cover that you see here is from a magazine called Pulp House. And it's been around for a while and then it went away for a while and then came back recently. It's uh, edited by Dean Wesley Smith. And the story that I have in that one is a little bit contemporary fiction, a little bit sci-fi, but not really. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to describe. Uh, so yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. So happy to have you and Lindsay both. Uh, all right, Jill, you're last. Let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, my name is Jill Tu. Uh, my uh, debut, The Dividing Sky, comes out next year. Um, it's a YA dystopian romance, and I primarily write um, near future science fiction um, about Black girls saving the world and occasionally falling in love along the way. I love that so much. Um, so to start ourselves out, why don't we start with what are tropes and how are they used in fiction? Let's start with Allegra. So I like to think of tropes as the building blocks of fiction. Uh, we can't reimagine, like, there are only so many stories to tell, and tropes are little Lego pieces that we use to tell them. Um, a story can be comprised of a whole bunch of tropes, and the key is putting them together in unique and interesting and fun ways, instead of the ways that, you know, we usually see them together. And I think we'll uh, probably talk a lot about cliches later on, but I think that that tropes are are foundational and cliches are a symptom of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, do you have anything to add, Lindsay? Uh, that was a really good explanation of tropes. Uh, I can add that they're not just the building blocks, they're sort of just the artistry of writing and media. Uh, they're sort of been made synonymous in contemporary lingo with cliches, even though that's not really true anymore. Tropes are sort of necessary structures for narrative, while cliche is the concept that certain types of those tropes and certain configurations of those tropes have become overused to the point of meaninglessness. And we sort of see them more and more becoming similar in like 
you can't use this trope anymore because it's overused. But like people are always going to use that trope. The thing is that no one's going to tell the same story with it. Absolutely. Um, Jill, you're smiling, so I'm going to pick on you. Do you have anything else to add? Uh-oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think all that was great. I think the only thing that I, I might tack on is I feel like tropes are um, a really good way to establish trust with a reader that their expectations are going to be met within a story. Um, you know, I think certain genres have conventions um, that have become tropes. And so if you're reading a mystery or a thriller or a horror or a romance, and you start to see some of those tropes that pop up um, in those genres, especially, um, it can make you as a reader feel like you're, you're in the hands of a capable storyteller. Yeah. Also, I think especially since I mean, you write near future science fiction and others of us write fantasy and even in contemporary, they sort of set the expectations which allow readers to suspend disbelief in whatever the setup is of the story, which is exceptionally useful for certain stories and very necessary. And there's signposts to readers to find books that they're gonna like. Some readers love certain tropes and when they know that they're in there, they know that they're probably gonna like the story. Yep. Exactly. And, and I really want to get um, your feedback as well, uh, Tatiana, on this. Well, I love the metaphor that Legger brought up in regards to Lego pieces, um, because I also think of tropes in patterns, as in tropes are typically repetitive patterns that we see in narratives that in time become story convention. So um, sometimes tropes don't start out as tropes. But once you start seeing them a lot, especially in a specific genre, which can define a subgenre, um, that's when they become tropes. Beautiful. And then uh, last but not least, uh, CH, do you have any uh, additions to what are tropes and how they're used in fiction? Yeah, so I think we've all touched upon the same idea um, that Allegra started, which is their building blocks. Um, I call them formulas. Uh, we're all used to certain formulas with certain genres, as, as folks have mentioned. And certain genres expect those formulas to be executed to the T. I mean, that's, for example, romance readers, they they need a happily ever after. You break that trope and you are not writing romance. <laughs> um, you're basically outside of that genre by that point. Um, how they're used in fiction, I, I mentioned romance, um, but like, it's like, you know, when you start a romance story, you're going to get to that happily ever after it sets expectations, as, as someone mentioned, I'm sorry, I forgot who, um, but also in this day and age, you think about how we find new stories, not just books, but media that we're consuming, you know, think about Netflix and the way it tags an algorithm and builds an algorithm around, oh, you like dark comedy, well, I think you're like, you know, these next 10 movies or series or whatever those algorithms are built on tropes um you know someone way back when when they started building the algorithms in the database um start categorizing those movies and those stories by certain tropes that they expect in those movies and so i think more than ever tropes are important for, to us in fiction um because as much as we hate to be defined by something that's formulaic it is also how people are going to discover our writing these days Absolutely. And that really does make me think a little bit about the tagging system on Archive of Our Own. And you have, you know, your found family and your enemies to lovers. And that's exactly how you find, um, you know, your favorite fiction is through these tags and tropes. Um, so what's the difference between a trope and a cliche? Like, how is the latter more problematic? Do you want to take this one away, Tatiana? Um, honestly, I think that the difference between a trope and a cliche can differ from reader to reader. Um, so I can only kind of speak for myself <laughs> and what I think a cliche is, but in a way, I think cliche is when a trope has lost its comfort, um, or has never really provided comfort in the first place. So for example, when we're thinking about the chosen one trope, we all know that's been used excessively in the fantasy genre specifically, especially epic fantasy. Um, at this point, it's kind of so well trodden that if you're not doing anything new or anything interesting with it and play straight, it can be, it can feel like a cliche. So it's kind of lost that comfort of, of what a trope was. Or on the other hand, 
when I say that when the, a com the comfort didn't exist at all, um, like for example, back in the day, 80s, 90s, fantasy, like barbarian tropes, some of them are very stereotypical. Some of them are very regressive. It never gave me comfort to read them at all. And I always consider them cliche. Um, so in some, in my opinion, cliches are tropes that make readers uncomfortable for all of the wrong reasons, either defined by repetitiveness or ignorance. Uh, I'm going to go with Jill next. I love that. I, I think that's that's really well said. Um, I think, yeah, if, if I could add on one thing, I think it's, it's it just comes down to execution. Like, I think you either have um, the range <laughs> to kind of breathe fresh air into a trope and do something different with it, um, or, or you're playing it straight, like Tatiana said, and, um, you know, there's really nothing no sort of like helpful signposts to, to lead a reader to the next element of the story, right? It just kind of, it just kind of feels like table stakes at that point. Yeah, but I, I would agree that it comes down to, you know, every individual, I think some people would say, maybe they're wrong, but they would say that maybe only one bed is cliche at this point. I think only one bed is great. <laughs> um, and it's like the gold standard trope and it's everywhere and everyone is okay with it being everywhere, right? Because every time it comes up, um, there's a different character dynamic at play or a different circumstance of the premise of the story at play. Um, so it doesn't just come down to kind of, you know, preponderance for me. It, it's it's really just about execution and um, entertainment value. I don't like the one bed trope, but because I'm not a romance reader. So sure, like, those right. tropes don't, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know every time I see one bed, I'm just like, really this again? But, you know, I think it really works when you really, really love a trope. Um, and I think that is really a fine line between trope and cliche. Mm -hmm. um, DH, do you have any input on this as well? Yeah, um, as Tatiana mentioned and Jill mentioned, uh, it, it really it comes down to the subjective taste. Um, I mean, I think the the global definition of a cliche is something that's just old and boring and tired because it's just been overused. Um, and it really uh, just comes down to whether the industry, if you will, I guess I'm doing air quotes, uh, is tired of a trope and will no longer publish it, but that doesn't mean that it's a cliche, you know? And so I think, for example, Lindsay doing turn the fairy tales and turning them on their heads and doing the gender bent version, like there's still room for that. There's still a big market for that. And I'm glad that it's still expanding and because nobody should be able to say, oh, well, fairy tales are done. It's a cliche. Like, well, no, there's different ways to subvert that trope, if you will, you know, speaking of subverting tropes and make it fresh and new, especially for an audience that has never seen it before and is dying for something like this. Um, I will say that how we determine whether a cliche is problematic, I don't think it's limited to just cliches. I think tropes can be problematic in themselves as well. Some of the things that we've talked about so far are tropes that are also problematic. You know, the barbarian... Um, trope with or the the new bio slave woman trope that was a big part of that genre way back when uh so i would just say from a problematic standpoint i think you know as tatia mentioned it depends on are you making someone uncomfortable is it just offensive is it i mean can we move past like the need for having new bio slave people <laughs> come on um <laughs> So I think I, I think it's I think when you examine what's problematic, it's it's you, know, you look at the whole picture. Is it the trope? Is it a cliche? Is it because it's cliche that it's problem problematic, or was it problematic to begin with because that trope sucked? Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. Totally agreed. Um, Allegra. Um. So all of these were fabulous answers, and I think there's um the one piece I can add is it's. <laughs> I treat tropes like I treat sex scenes. Are they adding something to the story? Are they actually moving the narrative forward or do you just expect them to be there? If you expect them to be there, in my opinion, they usually feel like cliches because they kind of just feel like you're shoehorning them in. <laughs> so I use the same metric. I remember earlier in my writing, I definitely did that. Like I would add so many things in just because I thought the reader expected them. 
Um, and now that I've progressed as a writer, I'm very happy whenever I'm like, hey, this thing is going to be in here. And then I'm like, just kidding, um, which is all about what subverting trope is. Um, so Lindsay, last remarks on tropes. For us on the panel as well is differentiating between what we mean by a problematic cliche and just a bad cliche because the problematic cliches are bad in themselves for obvious reasons but it is very easy when creating pieces of media to pick up sort of a small lego block that you might not necessarily realize is based in bad cliche or bad trope and build something worse out of it without even realizing it like um I think it's very easy, especially in fantasy, to sort of use blood libel as a cliche or a piece of world building without realizing that that is steeped heavily, heavily in anti-Semitism. Um, and just like those small things are tropes, sort of, or they're used as tropes, but you have to be completely aware of what you're doing when you are crafting a story to make sure that you don't fall into those areas or use them to build your story. So it is the job of the writer to sort of differentiate between the pieces that they're picking up for their work. Absolutely. And then what does it mean to subvert a trope? And what's the purpose of doing this? I know we touched a bit on it, or we've touched on it a little bit earlier as well. Um, do you want to take this one away, CH? Yeah, so subverting a trope, I mean, you're basically setting up a trope and, and setting up expectations, as we mentioned when we first started this panel, for a reader, and then you're whipping the rug out from under them, um, if that makes sense. So you're surprised them you're, you're you're twisting the trope around so that it is something something they did not expect and they didn't see it coming um sometimes it's really subtle um sometimes it's pretty obvious it's in your face um and uh you know one of the best examples of this which um is in the fantasy genre and is in a typically like up until this point in time is a very stereotypically epic fantasy type of story was game of thrones and I will preface this right now by saying I only skimmed through the first book and I didn't read the rest of the books, but I watched the entire series and I was like, what the heck? So, um, and that was the moment they killed Ned Stark. And I feel like, you know, we have been years out of this series, so I'm not spoiling anything. But I remember that and I hadn't watched the series that yet, but everybody was talking about it. They're like, I can't believe they did that. They just killed off a main character. They killed off Sean Bean. What is going to happen to this story? And that was the story subverting the trope of you don't kill main characters in the epic fantasy ever. They always survive. There's maybe a sacrificial character later on down the line. And you kind of see it coming, you know, in the final battle. You're like, okay, yeah, that, that character is going to be a sacrifice. But you never kill a main character, especially the character that everybody loves, right? And so that's set the subversion of later on down the series of oh nobody is safe and even then you get to the red wedding and you're like holy crap nobody is safe right and I will tell you that was the first episode I ever saw so that was a shock for me <laughs> um so yeah it's you know it's getting to that like when you can do it right when you can um you know really set that surprise for your reader and have them go oh my gosh, what just happened? I didn't see that coming. And just have that delicious feeling of, I want more, I want to keep reading. Then you've subvert, subverted that trope correctly. That is so nicely said. Um, Lindsay, you got anything for this one? I mean, I think it's just everything CH said and sort of depending on what genre you're writing in, how you lay the groundwork for the expectations and the subversion because I feel like one of the really difficult things is that when you are subverting a trope you still have to lay the groundwork for the expected outcome of the trope and to play on the trope that can either be supremely detrimental or very fun 
Um, it's like you have to walk a very thin line of sort of foreshadowing that you are going to subvert the trope without giving it away, just in a craft perspective. Absolutely. And I know as a reader, like that's like my number one thing. I'm like, I see this trope. I see this trope. Are they going to do it? Um, are they going to follow through? So uh, let's go with Tatiana. Um, well, that was definitely when when you asked the question, the Ned Stark was definitely the, the example that popped in my head immediately. And I still remember, because I read the series, and I still remember the moment I read The Red Wedding, where I was exactly the moment I read it. And honestly, like the entire series, A Song of Ice and Fire, is just a great masterclass of how to subvert tropes, how to set them up, and how to subvert tropes. Um, and that there are, as Lindsay said, pitfalls to kind of setting them up. For example, when Game of Thrones became mainstream in media, um, if you're not a fantasy lover and you don't know what the trope is that you're subverting, <laughs> it does get a little confusing for the readers if you don't know what the trope that you're subverting is. Um, so that's good, just kind of a little pitfall when you're when you're when you have to think about your audience and think about what your the knowledge that your audience knows and what they have, what the knowledge they have with the genre. But I do kind of think of cliches and subversions on opposite ends of the spectrum. So for example, cliches make readers uncomfortable for all the wrong reasons, whereas tropes make readers uncomfortable for all of the right reasons. Like we wanna surprise them, we wanna shock them, we want to just upend their expectations. Um, and I, and it's fun for me, the writer. <laughs> that sounds like so much fun. Um, Jill. Yeah. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I feel like um, to Tatiana's point, like knowing your genre so well that you can subvert a trope is almost like, it's like a love letter, like to to like the readers of, of that genre and the readers of those books to say, you know, I know you're expecting this archetype of a character or this kind of plot point. Um, here's a wink and a nod, uh, acknowledging that and also something new that I hope you also enjoy. I think it's like a really special sort of like silent dialogue uh, between a writer and a reader. Um, and then I do I do want to say, just piggybacking off of Lindsay's point and the, pre the previous question, I, I totally agree that, you know, a huge reason to subvert a trope is anytime you are dealing with a trope that's harmful based on your character's identities, um, you have an obligation to strongly kind of question and, and investigate and interrogate that trope um, and to subvert it to um, to to make a statement, right? Um, I think I think a lot of times tropes are a sign of the times that they were kind of like created in or, or baked in. And by subverting them, you can say something new about kind of where we are um, in the art form. And even bring awareness to the issue because mm -hmm. are are these tropes really patterns of a common human experience or are they mm -hmm. product of what voices have been dominant in the industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also you have to ask yourself if you should even be using the trope and subverting it, or if you should just be not utilizing it at all mm -hmm. and letting it die. Mm -hmm. Because I think we sometimes have like wonderful ideas about all the good that we can do with a subverted trope, but when you're laying the ground groundwork for that expectation, what harm is it still doing even though if you're going to subvert it in the end? All yeah, you, all of that. <laughs> yeah, it was because um, all <laughs> uh, you know, all of that is, I think, the the foundational and the important stuff. And I kind of want to touch on on the craft side of things that there is a million ways to subvert tropes. It can be twisting a trope upside down. It can be you know gender swapping it. It can be pairing tropes that don't usually go together and letting them clash up against each other or even using a trope that's become a cliche and making it very obvious from the get-go that you're going to subvert it and winking at the audience and just being like yes they died and there definitely weren't any bodies you know <laughs> at this point we all know that those people are alive even though the characters obviously don't it's it's 
like powerful because you can deal with a lot of really important topics and it's also playful in this way where you can stretch as an author and let yourself live in this liminal space between what the reader expects and what they don't <laughs> and they never know quite which side you're going to lean into yes i definitely had a lot of that reading these violent delights by chloe gong um, it's a Romeo Juliet retelling, and it does such a fantastic job of taking those Romeo and Juliet cliches that we hear and see all the time and just upending them completely. All right. So the question is, when does a subverted trope become a trope of its own? So I, I think we've all seen it. So... Uh, Jill, want to take us off? Yeah, I, I think my answer is pretty simple. It's when readers say so. I don't know that there's like a fine line. Um, it's just, you know, when, when you've seen it enough that it kind of becomes uh, a standard of the readership. Uh, CH, want to go next? Yeah, I think it's when it you know, the readers decide, but also when it just gets into the zeitgeist enough that it becomes mainstream and it becomes merged and melded into everyone else's consciousness as they're writing and creating art. Um, I think about, you know, all the tropes around vampires, you know, today, you know, you stake them through the heart, you, they're aversion to garlic, you know, they can't walk in the day. This whole, all of these tropes actually came about from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like they all had a single origin. And I don't think um, we think about that, you know, if you write vampire fiction where that comes from. And so um, this is going to be controversial. But, you know, I remember when <laughs> Stephanie Meyer came out with Twilight and people were like, vampires don't sparkle. Like it's her story. Like, why are you? you know, I mean, as much as, like, it's not for me, you know, her, her, her trilogy was, her fiction was not for me, I did read it, um, just because I was asked to by a friend, but, uh, but still, it's like, you know, that was the trope she chose to subvert, and so, um, just because we hadn't seen it done before doesn't mean she couldn't do it, you know, and so, uh, but yeah, just thinking about, like, all the conventions we have of vampire fiction, like, that all came about because of one dude who wrote, hundred you know decades ago um so yeah I think when everyone else is doing the same thing yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then Lindsay do you have any other like examples of this or um when do you think a subverted trope becomes a trope of its own uh I think when it when the people using it are no longer questioning why they're using it if they're just doing it because it's expected and they're going obviously the vampires can't deal with garlic why would they be able to and it's just like no you actually could change this up it could be anything you want um i think there's a series called blind sight which is i actually don't know when it came out anymore but um it, it takes the vampire trope or just the vampire concept and does something different with it in terms of like how vampires might have evolved and how they would function in the real world and it draws from vampire lore without falling into some of the more common tropes that we have in vampire literature and i think subverted tropes like the ones in vampire literature become tropes of their own when you're no longer questioning that or building your own lore and world building behind it and thinking about why vampires to continue that would be as they are in your world instead of building them for your own work. Totally agree. Um, Allegra, any others? You know, kind of building off of this that they start becoming more mainstream. And a good indicator for me is when they start getting bundled with other tropes. <laughs> um, like, I'm sure the one bed trope was at one point a subversion because everyone was sleeping in separate beds and being all like formal and Victorian. Uh, at one point, someone did it for the first time and then it just came bundled into romance, right? Um, 
And so a subverted trope usually like sticks out. You're thinking about it. You're talking about it. And the moment you're like, yes, this and 12 other things were in this novel. It's probably a trope on its own. So I really remember the first time somebody explained Twilight to me and they said, it's a girl who's in love with a vampire and he doesn't eat her. <laughs> like, and that was, that was how I read Twilight. That was how I read Twilight. Um, Tatiana, anything else? Um, well, all, these were all very fascinating and great answers. Um, I think that it's very fascinating how some inverted tropes have originated because of a hole in the genre. Um, so for example, epic fantasy, there's the hero trope, but now there's the anti-hero trope and how they go on to define their own subgenre. For example, cozy fantasy is now defined by low stakes, which is completely opposite from epic fantasy. So it's very interesting how sometimes um, these subverted tropes become tropes <laughs> and define subgenres of their own. I have to add on to that the entire time I've just been thinking about the Mary Sue and the anti Sue. <laughs> And then uh, at this point, which tropes do you think have, or do you believe have to be subverted at this point? Which are so cliche that they shouldn't be used in their typical form? Let's start with Lindsay on this one. It's unfortunate because I don't really have an answer for this. Um, I think it depends very heavily on what sort of genre and category you're working in and what you're aiming to do like what the thesis of your work is will depend on like I just think it depends I guess is my short answer for it but um like I think one of the things that has sort of become not necessarily a trope but an expectation of modern literature especially in high fantasy is the redemption of one of the villains or the antagonist I'm like sometimes you don't redeem them. Sometimes they're just bad. Uh, so I feel like things like that are very interesting to watch and good to do. But um, otherwise, I think it really just depends on what you're working in. But yeah, it's a very vague answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um... Tatiana, any ideas on which tropes that you think have to be subverted at this point? Well, I agree with Lindsay and I say it depends. Um, I mean, it depends on the reader, it depends on the audience and the genre. So for example, people crap on YA books a lot and uh, on their very common tropes that are often played straightforward. But the audience of these YA books are often being introduced to these tropes for the first time. Um, so it really depends on the intention, you know, the readership. I, I can tell you what I find, <laughs> you know, cliche, what I like to see things done. But generally, overall, I think it depends. Allegra? A couple questions ago, and I think this has been brought up a few times, is there are tropes that should just be retired. They're done. They're harmful. They're hurting real people in the real world. They just need to go away. Then there are all these tropes that are in gray areas where if they're not subverted, they're harmful and awful and bad. And if they are subverted, they're suddenly talking about how that thing was harmful and awful and bad. And now we're having a discussion about it. And now we're moving forward and we're doing something interesting. So to me, those gray area tropes are the ones where if you are including them, I really hope to see a subversion because I'm I'm tired of a damsel in distress. Just just I don't I don't want to see it. But at the same time, it's not a innately harmful trope to have one character taken out of the plot that needs to then be rescued by the other character. So in its in its subverted form, you know, you you damsel your villain. <laughs> And suddenly it's really interesting, but on its own in its unsubverted form, it can be in that gray area, kind of icky, and we're done with it now. Yeah, and I know that's also a little genre specific as well, like that particular trope, because it's it's across genres, I think, and tropes cross so many different genres. Um, 
it's just very interesting. Uh, Jill, anything to add? Yeah, I, I was just, I was thinking, because I was like, are there any that I could like pinpoint? I feel like maybe I'm like an eternal optimist or just like, I, I believe like so many of these can be like recycled, right? Like not all of them, absolutely. But like there's some that just kind of reflect the way, don't reflect the way that we behave as a society anymore. I think of like the old like 1940s, 1950s movies where it's like slap, slap, kiss, right? Um, like that's totally a trope, like a like a convention of like old film uh, that is gross now. <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean that that dynamic underlying that of like, I hate you. No, actually, I've been in love with you this entire time isn't actually very interesting. So I do feel like um, there's nuance there um, of kind of re-examining some of those old tropes, um, just updating them with things that, with behavior that's more appropriate. Absolutely. Uh, Siege, anything on this one? So I have a personal pet peeve, and that is when fridging occurs. And it, I see it like once when I learned of it. And so what fridging is for, if you haven't heard of it yet, it, it's when um, you kill a woman to motivate a male character and move the plot forward. And it stemmed from a comic, um, an issue of the comic Green Lantern back in like the 50s, I want to say, where they killed the Green Lantern's girlfriend, stuffed her in the fridge, um, left her there for the Green Lantern to find when he returned home. And that like motivates him to, you know, act out the rest of the story. And it's just dumb. And I don't feel like there's a good way to subvert this trope because, okay, I'm going to kill the man. I'm going to kill the child. I'm going to kill the pet. John Wick, I refuse to see that series because I got started with it. And my husband walked in the room, saw what I was seeing and said, oh, they kill a dog and it's on the screen. I'm like, nope, they changed the channel because I refuse to watch that sort of thing on screen. And 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 that it, that has spawned how many movies now? Four John Wick movies? And so I don't know that there's a good way to serve this trope. And I understand why people do it because it's a, like they're trying to propel the protagonist, you know, because we've all been taught the protagonist has to be proactive. They have to have a reason to move forward get out of their their sense of inertia and I, i'm just like there's got to be other ways to do this because this feels really lazy and just old to me um that said i you know I, I don't know i just cannot think of an example where this is done well right now and if somebody has one then that's great um i would love to see it but i feel like that needs to just die a horrible death um <laughs> i would have said the same thing about zombies However, I finally saw The Last of Us five minutes into the series of episode one. Mind you, I was horrified. I was terrified of what was going to happen. I was like, this is crazy. This is nuts. This is insane. I want more. And I never thought I would say that about a zombie series, but they're not zombies. Technically, they're infected. It's a post-apocalyptic world, and it's not my favorite trope. It's not my favorite setting. I was like, it's. I love Pedro Pascal. I love Bella Ramsey. I'm like, these are great actors. Not for me. And then for some reason, you know, we just decided to sit down and watch it one day, and I was like, holy crap, this is new. Like to me, the way they explain the post the apocalypse that happens. And I think the reason why it was so terrifying and intriguing to me is that it was plausible. And so that hooked me. And so, uh, you know, other tropes, I would say, you know, I don't know that, you know, like everyone else, it's subjective. I don't know that I could say, you know, it needs to go away. Um, so th that was another example one where I was like, well, I was not zombies, but I really enjoyed this last one. Yes, that yeah. kind of reminds me of, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh no, sorry. Uh I was just going to add on, it just kind of reminds me of the idea that in the industry, we see a lot of the same tropes written by the same sort of people over and over and over again. And so that can make the trope feel old. And then maybe a person gets a chance to explore the space of that trope in a different way that they might not have gotten. And that makes it feel new just because like we've seen the dystopian played out in young adult a lot over the years but like it's not that the trope is bad and that it's always going to feel old it's that we were stuck writing the same sort of narrative about the same sort of people over and over again and like something 
jumping in on that point, going back to the uh, fridging trope that I agree, it's horrible. Um, but even even tropes like that sometimes can can have life and you know and be scrubbed clean of their ick uh when they're moved into a completely new genre for example you know a superhero story where a character gets fridged and the fridge is literally a portal to the super spy lair and you know everyone has to disappear like they're almost every trope if you like suddenly put it in humor where it's always been serious or or you know switch it up and pair it with something absolutely ludicrous can sometimes save even the worst even the most problematic of tropes that aren't you know the the ism tropes we don't like those 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 just uh, die in a fire i would love to see it i really would I'm just... but to do yeah. it effectively like the writer needs to know the history of the trope how the trope has functioned in order to subvert that trope well enough Yep, I think it goes back to what CH was saying, like every every example she's seen has been lazy, right? But if you do your research and you have kind of the backstory um, and you thought of a really creative way and you were, you know, you, you wanted to make a statement in the way that you used, you know, some element of story, you know, it, it would be less lazy and a lot more thoughtful. Okay, and then the next question is, how does subverting a trope help to comment on problematic tropes? This is personally my favorite question, by the way. <laughs> Do you want to start us off, Allegra? Because there's so many different flavors of problematic, it's really hard to make a blanket statement. Um, but to me, subverting a trope that the audience is expecting points an arrow at the problem and says, look here, this is the issue. This is what we're talking about. And it's it needs to be done with enough room to breathe so that we can say, okay, here's the problem and let's work through it. Let's see what the repercussions are. Let's see what happens. And it introduces the audience to the core problem in that trope in a new light that might let them see it as problematic where they may have just seen it as a trope my, my the pitfall i think that a lot of authors fall into is they use a subversion for shock value and then they don't follow through on actually discussing why the subversion was necessary to begin with totally agree totally agree um jill yeah, I think that's I think that's brilliant. And what I also um, what I thought you were going to say, Allegra, and what I'll add is that sometimes when we subvert those problematic tropes, we also point a little bit of a finger at the reader um, or the readership. Um, I can think of a few examples in the past couple of years of books with um, black girl leads that had um, a romance arc that could be described as insta love, um, and there was a lot of uproar. Um, from from various parts of the of the reader community about like oh it's like insta love like you know and I think and insta love in, in particular I think you know it's not everyone's favorite um, but it seemed kind of disproportionate in this case and um, in one case one of the authors Tracy Dion came out and said you know I find it interesting um, that that this is you know this kind of um, this criticism is happening um, and and I when she was thinking about creating a romance arc with this character, you know, I think in a lot of ways, she said that she wanted, she was intentional about choosing Insta Love because she wanted it to be um, seen and witnessed that a black girl could be loved without questioning or debate. There's no, oh, how do I feel about this girl? I'm not really sure um, if I'm interested in her. It was like, no, like she's black and, you know, white girls uh, get Insta Love all the time. So why not? Yeah, to your point, Jill, um... I think that was really excellent and that often commenting on these problematic tropes is a form of empowerment and, and a form of reclaiming these tropes that historically have not been for us. <laughs> so for example, I guess just an example from my own works is I investigate a lot of barbarian tropes, which is why I had brought that up earlier. And one of the barbarian tropes I hated <laughs> was the, the big chested barbarian woman, right? 
but I leaned into it and gave my character that. Um, so, you know, her back hurts, <laughs> you know, it's not all fun and games. It's, it's, it's just a reclaiming of this is what it is to be a woman <laughs> or, you know, like this is what it is to be, to just, just reclaiming a trope that we didn't have access to before. I love that so, so much. Um, CH, do you have um, anything on how subverting tropes helps to comment on problematic tropes? Yeah, I think um, I think it was Allegra who pointed this out of, um, you know, talking about the trope and bringing it out in the open and, you know, lampshading it kind of illuminates these issues for us that we, um, you know, sometimes we bring up these issues and other people don't understand um so and it's kind of hard sometimes to talk about these issues um until you find the people who do understand and then you realize oh I'm not alone you know I'm not all in my head I'm not just like thinking these things up and I'm being too sensitive or whatever it is and one of the examples that I thought of um was the movie and I know this is maybe not a book but at the movie Knives Out now I loved this movie. Um, it is traditional mystery at its finest. There are so many mystery tropes being played out here, but at the same time, it twists and subverts a key trope, and that is who did it and why did you suspect or did not suspect who the true murderer was? And uh, it comments on our perceptions of society, of class, of privilege, of skin color, of where we are in our job roles. Um, in a way that, you know, to be frank, some of my friends who are from that background or are similar to that background, they didn't love this movie as much as I did. And I think it's because they didn't see it as clearly as someone who has been in that position of being invisible, you know, of being underestimated. Um, sorry, I'm not saying that I am, but, you know, just I could really relate to, um, you know, the character who walks away the hero in the end, you know, and so... Uh, it was just really stark to me to see the differences in how people reacted to that movie, depending on, you know, where they came from. And it didn't matter if you were a mystery nut or not. Like for me, like this is when I was first starting to write mystery. And so I was not as well versed in it um, back then, but even then I could see some of these tropes playing out because uh, it definitely is inspired by uh, traditional mystery, like Agatha Christie's closed room mysteries. Um, so I, it just, for me, highlighted all these issues that I felt like I couldn't put in words, and yet here it is on full display on a silver screen for everyone to watch, and then seeing the reactions was just priceless. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that that is a way uh, tropes, subverting tropes can bring these issues to light. That's so wonderful. Um, Lindsay, do you have anything else? Uh, sort of in the opposite direction of that, sort of like the actual opposite of that, I think sometimes it can be very helpful to lean into not subverting what would previously be considered a problematic trope when it is a trope such as like, so one of the tropes has been um, female young adult characters losing their powers at the end of series, where everyone's like, you can't do that anymore, you shouldn't do it, but Primarily the series in which that has happened, they have been white girls in positions of power already. So I think like if you lean into keeping that trope and they have to give up their power for people, that is a good non-subversion of that trope. Like you have to sacrifice some level of your social power to help other people. You can lean into things and they're still good sometimes. You just have to deal with the nuance of that in your world. So like, I feel like very much depending on what you want to do in the work, sometimes not subverting a trope can be more powerful. Absolutely. And Tatiana, did you have anything else to add to this as well? Um, no, I don't think I have anything else okay. to add. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so what are the different types of trope subversion? There's averted, inverted, lampshade, that sort of thing. Uh, what are some of these other different types and how are they just different from each other? 
Jill, want to take this one away? I honestly had to look some of these up. Um, <laughs> I was like, what are these? What is this? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I I will say that like one of my favorites is is to lampshade. I think that's like one of one of the one of the funnest ones to read too, um, when it's done well. But I, yeah, I I don't think I'm enough of an expert to necessarily define the different like flavors of subversion. I just kind of know it when I see it. Yeah, I also look them up. I think most of them are just on TV tropes or like mm -hmm. averted and inverted and lampshaded are the ones I think that maybe didn't start there or like, but I also agree. I think lampshaded is the most fun. It's basically when you acknowledge that you're doing a cliche and you just lean into it and you go, it's here, we know, now no one look at it. Yeah. Uh, but um, I think or inverted- look at it for a whole, oh, sorry. Or look at it for a whole novel. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please look at this one trope. <laughs> look at nothing else. Pay attention to comment. zero things other than this. Um, but yeah, I think inverted to something we've already spoken on. It's sort of like subverting, but it's just where you invert it. Yeah, and then averting, obviously, is just avoiding the trope whatsoever. Like, it's like, hey, I could set this up, but you can see that I'm not. So moving on. <laughs> so, and then I think my favorite personally is zigzag. Like I could read a book like The Last Tale of the Flower Bride and the entire time, you know, I could call something on page 60 and I didn't know until the end of the book, did they follow through on that trope or not? It's just like, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And it keeps setting it up and acknowledging it that maybe it is, maybe it's not. Allegra. Terms are, again, I, I also, like I knew some of them. I didn't know all of them going in. And I've always, I've always felt like it's, subverting tropes is kind of like working in clay like you, you there's boxes and ways you can shape it that are supposed to be but sometimes you just have to kind of like splat something on see if it sticks oh it didn't you punch it back down you build it up again oh maybe this worked nah not really <laughs> um, there's a playfulness to subverting tropes until you get it just right that I think is much more of a spectrum than strict like because sometimes it will be like an inversion, but also a zigzag, <laughs> and or you know a subversion, but we're also lampshading it really loudly. Um, so there's there's all this thing with everything we've talked about. Like it comes down to nuance and tropes use and misuse and you know alterations all come down to the story you want to tell in the way you want to tell it about the issues that you feel passionate about um, and making it fit with that to me is so much more important than making it check a box of how exactly you treated a trope. I love that. Um, Tatiana? Yeah, so as I had mentioned in my example before, one of my favorite kind of tropes to do with a lean-in trope, to play it so straight, like a, to a real, realistic point of view, <laughs> to, to, to a realistic point. Um, but it is fun to put in a bunch of different types of tropes diversions and just keep, in, just keep the readers on their toes, <laughs> see if they're paying attention. Yeah, so I and I'm really sorry, but I got confused and I can't remember who I haven't touched yet on this question. It's me. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Because Where did I, I, go? Also, <laughs> I also had to do homework on this. Um, if you've listened to me speak before, you know that I am a discovery writer through and through. I have tried outlining. I've tried so many different methods. And so like thinking about tropes in this like very studious academic way was like, Oh, I was like pulling teeth for me. <laughs> so uh, yes, go to tvtropes.org. As Lindsay mentioned, there's an entire page on all of these tropes if you want to study them and see, you know, how they work and operate and things like that. Um, for me, I, I, um, I, I find myself sometimes in the trap of writing to a trope 
And then when I notice that, then I'll then I'll stop and think, okay, why am I doing this? Why is this character doing this? Is there something? Am, am I doing this because this is just what I'm familiar with, or am I doing this because the characters wants, desires, motivations is driving toward that, you know? And so more often than not, I'm like stopping and analyzing backward to see, okay, is, you know, what am I doing here rather than sitting down and planning it out ahead of time. Um, but I will say, I'm sorry to interrupt Lindsay earlier when I said the entire no novel based on tropes, I was thinking of John Scalzi's red shirts. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> I see a leg if you are a Trekkie, a Star Trek fan, science fiction fan, a space exploration of any sort, and you're familiar with the red shirt trope, you have to read this book. Yeah. Um, I know ask John... me any time for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and like, because it's just, you think in an entire novel that Lampshade's one trope would be boring, but it's not. And it, he just takes it to the nth degree. And then you get to the end, you're like, wait, was that the whole trope? And, uh, and, I, and, you know, we just finished watching uh, the last season of Picard last, last night. It was great. It was fantastic. TNG is my Star Trek. That was the version I grew up with. So it's my favorite. Um, Picard is my favorite captain, obviously. Although, you know, Cisco is a close second. I'm not going to lie. Um, anyway, and the whole time we're like, wait, that character just got killed and they're wearing a gold shirt. Wait, they're not in a red shirt. And then you get to the last scene and I had a laugh because you've got the bridge crew and every single one is in a red shirt. I'm like, I bet they did this deliberately. <laughs> they had to. You have to know your audience, right? So, yeah. Okay. Um, so that was... said that I... Oh, go I ahead. Say, I, please, I, please, I go ahead. the focus a novel on an entire trope you had me wondering if there's some like twisted like Stephen King misery style book where people are like chained to one bed for like an entire book <laughs> it's like how horrible would that be but there's not there's, not, there's about to be. enough <laughs> yeah I feel like I feel like, I would feel like comedy is the peak let's just dive into this genre for that right right absolutely um so that was our last question y'all have some final thoughts and wrap up and maybe a plug and tell people where to find you starting with Allegra um so you can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet as author Allegra I run a uh, discord for uh disabled and LGBTQ and diverse authors and readers in general and we do a lot of fun stuff um, and if you like subverted tropes, you will probably like my book. Uh, this uh, this one where shadows lie is the start to most of my series. And it starts with the chosen one dying in the prologue. Uh, so if that sounds like the sort of thing that you like to read and you like disabled main characters who neither kick ass nor are uh, inspiration for able-bodied people and just are disabled, uh, you will probably enjoy it. And it's been an absolute pleasure being here. It, this has been wonderful. And I cannot express how happy I am that we are discussing tropes and that these, this playfulness and also this like pointed commentary is becoming part of the, the accepted expression of fiction writing. I'm afraid, uh, Lindsay. Uh, yeah, just to also add on to that, thank you so much for hosting us and the panel and having us all talk about this because it was exceptionally fun and enjoyable. Um, I guess I'm on the internet everywhere with my name. Uh, you just have to spell it correctly because otherwise I'm a photographer who has a much more impressive portfolio than me. <laughs> um, but you can find me on Twitter at, at Lindsay Miller. Uh, where I mostly talk about fantasy novels and probably video games too much. Um, otherwise, I have Prince of Thorns and Nightmares and then a story and an anthology coming out later this year. And yeah, that's what I'm up to. Also, I know we mentioned Tracy Dion, but please read Tracy's books. They're very good. 
Jill? They are very good. Uh, <laughs> so you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at J2Writes, T-E-W, writes like writing. Um, you can also listen to me and my besties talk uh, writing craft. I think we even have an episode on, maybe on tropes, I can't remember, um, the Afronauts podcast. Uh, we also have guests on, we got Tracy Dion on um, last year. Um, and so we have some some fun author interviews too. Um, and then my uh, debut novel, uh, YA dystopian romance called The, Div the Dividing Sky, that way, um, comes out next year from Joy Revolution, uh, Penguin Random House. Uh, think of the swooniest bits of Divergent set in a world that's like Jeff Bezos's fever dream. And that's kind of what we got. Um, <laughs> subverted tropes include amnesia, only one bed, twice, um, enemies to lovers, and bodyguard trope. So it's really fun. And uh, I do want to say, yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. I feel like Allegra nailed it. It's that like balance of play and responsibility that kind of is the job. So this was really great. Absolutely. C.H. Chung. You had me, Jill, and how you said Jeff Bezos' fever, fever dream. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, so I you can find me on my website, chung.com. And so I've got bits and pieces all over the place. So there's, I mean, that's just the best place to see it all listed. Um, and my last story that came out, uh, it's called Love the Way She Saw It. It's a twist on the Pygmalion Galatea story. So, um, which some people don't see coming, I think, but I'm not going to speak for it. <laughs> I'll just let the writing stand for itself. Um, but yeah, I am not like a super outgoing public figure I keep um very very much to myself so if you want to get a hold of me um please just ping me on the website or you can ping me on twitter at ch hung writes which is w-r-i-t-e-s or facebook same handle I might drop twitter though twitter's a dumpster fire <laughs> I don't have a dumpster fire emoji but I would like right now just blared across the screen <laughs> I know I just I don't know where to go besides Twitter because everyone's migrating on you know Mastodon or social like all these different platforms and it sucks because we had such a great writing community on Twitter and oh anyway I personally not love, to derail um, this yes sorry continuing to derail just for a moment because I personally love pillow fort it's like tumblr mixed with live journal um because it has those live journal group feature if anyone remembers live journal Anyway, continuing on, Tatiana. <laughs> um, just to re reiterate what everyone has says has said before. Um, thank you very much to Write Hive and thank you, Rachel, for moderating and giving us the space to have this public forum about tropes. Um, as Jill said, tropes is a mix between playfulness and responsibility, and I, that is at the core of a lot of my writing. Um, you can find me with a play on my name, Obey the Author, everywhere on the internet. <laughs> um, my novel, Bones to the Wind, it's about a coming of age competition between two rival young women. And it deconstructs all sorts of tropes, but primarily coming of age tropes and coming of age narratives. Um, the first book is Bones of the Wind. The second book is Dragging Your Bones in a series called A Forging of Age. <laughs> um, so if you're looking for subverted tropes, and check out my work. Thank you. Beautiful. And finally, I'm Rachel Shadle. You can find me at Archive of Our Own, Discord or Twitter at Analassi. It's A-N-N-A-L-A-S-S-I. If you want more content, you can check out all the wonderful videos available on this YouTube channel. For now, if you're watching this live during the conference, please join us for the live Q&A over at the Bright Hive Discord. Thank you for joining us today and for this panel.